Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. County Fair season is well underway in Oklahoma and we are so happy to join you this week from the Payne County Fair where 4-H'ers and FFA members are busy right now showing sheep. Meantime, out in the field, we're talking about insects and summer crops, as well as how to get ready for fall planting with our extension entomologist, Tom Royer. Um, we're having to, you know, answer some questions and, and maybe go back to making decisions about how to control the aphids and when to control them in double crop grain sorghum. Unfortunately, we don't have as many answers for forage sorghum because it's planted so thick, it's so tall, um, we don't even know if the insecticides are as effective on, as they <clears throat> would be on grain sorghum. So we have some examples here uh, and they're loaded with sugarcane aphids. So we can take a look at them, kind of point out what to be looking for, um, unfortunately, by the time you see things like this, with the slick leaves that's, uh, that's covered with the honeydew, that means you should have been treating two weeks ago because these aphids have built up. And so underneath there, as you can see, we have a lot of aphids, but we also have some lady beetles that are munching away at these aphids. The unfortunate thing though, this would be like one lady beetle ordering 15 steak dinners. They can't eat it all. There's just not, there's just too much food for them. So they can't keep up with the aphids. So by this time though, you say it's too far gone to, you to can, really do you much? You can control them, but uh, you would have prevented some yield loss if you'd have gotten out here early and scouted and, and made that decision a couple of weeks ago. You would have preserved better yield. So you have another plant here yes. that you wanted to show us. Yes. What were you seeing when you analyzed the leaves on this plant? Um, this is an example. This is something that can spill over into wheat, especially if it's early planted wheat. But here is an example of uh, fall armyworm infestation that's probably occurring on this plant. This is what we call window painting. This is an example of window painting. This is when the caterpillars are so small they literally can't chew through the leaf, so they scrape the tissue off. As they get bigger, they can go through the leaf and chew the whole leaf off. With fall armyworm, we're seeing examples here, and we're seeing flights occur. Anybody that's planting wheat right now, uh, we want to make sure to let the uh, wheat growers know that if they're wanting to accumulate forage for stalker cattle, they need to be out there early to make sure these armyworms aren't killing their their seedlings as they're coming up out of the ground now. Let's go ahead and take a look at some some soybeans. All right. Tom, what are you seeing? Right here, this is with soybeans, this is what we're wanting to protect right now from stink bugs and corn earworms. This is an example of pod feeding, probably I'm guessing from a caterpillar, but uh, pod and pod feeding is occurring right here as well. If you get enough numbers, it can it can significantly rob the yield and this is what we're trying to protect at this point in time. So tell us what this is. This is a tool that uh, we're evaluating uh, from a company called Sensa and, and they uh, get producers to subscribe to this. But the interesting thing about this is it's a traditional pheromone trap that you can bait with uh, any number of uh, different pheromones to trap moths depending on what you're interested in capturing. But the unique part of this is that there's a camera mounted on top here that uh, will take pictures of cat catches on a daily basis and identify the new catches that occur um, and then send that electronically back to the subscribers so that they know what kind of flight activity is occurring for the particular moth that they're interested in, in monitoring. Well, keep us posted on, on how it works and okay. whether this kind of technology is, is a model to just help with that scouting picture and yeah. fields and crops. Yep. Tom, good to see you. Good we'll see you again you. soon. All right, thanks. Now to an important story for livestock producers. We've heard Glenn Selk talk a lot over the years about the dangers of cattle eating forage with high levels of nitrates, especially this time of year. SUNUP's Curtis Hare takes us to Custer County to learn more. Sudan hay is one of the main forages in Custer County. Extension educator Ron Wright says though this type of sorghum is a good feed, toxicity issues are always a concern. When you raise Sudan hay, you can run into nitrate problems with it. 
which can affect cattle in several different ways. Uh, we've been in a, in a pretty severe drought in this county for the, for the most of the summer. And so we've, we've had a lot of Sudan hay that, that showed up being high in nitrates. Uh, I know of one producer that, that fed a, a ba round bale of Sudan hay and lost five cows. I heard of another one that lost two. Weight loss, aborted calves, and death in livestock are just some issues high nitrate levels in feed can cause. Uh, when that high concentration comes, let's say if the plant stay in a drought condition for too long and after comes a rain, after the rain that wake up those plants from the drought time is when we are going to have a high concentration of nitrate. The plant itself isn't necessarily the problem, but another type of grass that many producers are familiar with. When you plant Sudan, Sudan fields, you tend to get quite a bit of Johnson grass that can come up in those fields. And when they bale that, they'll bale that all up together in the bale. It's always that question, is Johnson grass a weed or a forage? Well, keep in mind that Johnson grass was introduced here as a forage. And actually, it's a good forage. This is considered noxious weed. So that's why sometimes you wanted to control it. You can have nitrate and also prussic acid toxicities. Cattle can, can pretty much tolerate up to 5,000 parts per million. Um, but once it gets to a certain point, if it gets up over 10,000 parts per million, you can't mix that with enough other stuff to make it okay to feed it. Producers should not just be concerned with the presence of Johnson grass in the field, but also outside of it. We had a producer in this county who had some cattle that got out. Uh, there were 32 head of them. 31 head of them it didn't affect. Had one, ca one cow that we found that had gone down. You run into all kinds of problems that can be avoided if you bring that into your extension office and have them do a quick test on it using diphenylamine uh, on samples. While your local extension educators can tell if nitrates present, the only way to know exactly how much nitrates in your forage is to send a sample here at the university. For more information about nitrates and forage, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Many of the uh, upcoming value-added calf sales will be taking place in October, and that means that uh, those folks that are involved with those kinds of calf sales will be wanting to watch for the proper weaning dates, because most of those value-added calf sales require the calves are weaned for at least 45 days before the sale date. Now, some producers may wonder why 45 days? Why isn't just 30 days or 20 days long enough? Well, there's some really good research that takes a look at that particular question. Done in Iowa a number of years ago, they actually, uh, over a nine year period of time, kept track of the records of 2,000 head of calves that went into some of the feedlots in that area. And they watched which of those calves had been weaned for 30 days or longer compared to calves that were weaned th uh, less than 30 days when they entered the feedlot. What they found was uh, quite a remarkable difference in terms of the percentage of the calves that got sick, primarily bovine respiratory disease. Of the calves that were weaned less than a month before they entered the feedlot, 28% over that nine year period of time became ill with bovine respiratory disease as compared to only 13% of the calves that had been weaned 30 days or longer. And uh, even more, uh, and perhaps just as important, was the fact that of the calves that had been weaned longer than 30 days, only 1% were required to have more than one uh, treatment in order to get over the illness, as compared to 6% of the calves that were weaned a shorter period of time, needing two or three treatments in order to uh, be uh, taken care of for whatever disease uh, problem they had. So that's why these calves need to be weaned at least 30 days or longer to where the chances of them getting sick for the new owner has been reduced substantially. We know of course that uh, the VAC 45 programs they require proper vaccinations as well and that's part of the story in terms of reducing disease entities as well. But I thought you'd like to understand why we need to have those calves weaned 45 days before the value-added calf sale comes up 
so that that next owner can buy them with some assurance that they'll have a lower incidence of health problems. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SunUp's Cow-Calf Corner. Daryl Peel, our livestock marketing specialist, joins us now. Daryl, I can't believe we're already into September and talking about fall marketing of calves. What are you seeing with the market? Well, you know, if you take uh, just normal seasonal patterns from where we are right now, we would normally expect these calves to drop off to a, a low in October. Um, certainly we have a little bit bigger calf crop this year, so we know there will be a, a sizable calf run. There's plenty of uh, pressure there, if you will, or tendency for that seasonal price uh, to develop that way. Of course, it depends, uh, in the, especially in the Southern Plains, uh, we're going to be looking at wheat pasture conditions and some fall demand factors. Those can mitigate that seasonal pattern a little bit. So we have to watch it as it goes, but generally we would look for lower prices, seasonally lower prices as we move into uh, through September and into October. In terms of strategy, are there retained ownership possibilities for fall wean calves? You know, cow-calf producers uh, that could be selling wean calves in, say, October, um, you know, may want to look at the opportunity to retain those calves through a stalker phase. Um, they'll be evaluating, um, you know, sort of the value of putting some additional weight on those calves. Uh, often, it's going to depend uh, on how light the calves are at weaning and how long you might retain them or how much total weight you might put on them. They're going to eva eva evaluate that much like a stalker producer would. Uh, and, and there does appear to be some opportunities. It's just going to depend on those details. I'd put a pencil to it. Oklahoma, of course, is a big uh, wheat pasture grazing state. How is the situation looking there as we head into wheat planting time? Well, you know, obviously the big question is, is will we have wheat pasture? Uh, conditions look real, generally pretty good, I think, at this point. We've had rain in a lot of places. It's been a little bit spotty. Uh, but, uh, you know, so we'd be watching that now. I remember a year ago at this time, it also looked pretty good. Uh, we had some moisture. We had cooler temperatures, cooler soils. Uh, but as it turned out, when the rain shut off in September, it never really started again. And so we didn't wind up with a very good wheat pasture year. Uh, so we'll have to watch that going forward. And what about those considering the cold cow market? Well, you know, a lot of these cow-calf producers, they wean the calves in the fall. They'll be looking at those cull cows. Uh, again, seasonally, we normally look for a low. It actually happens usually in November, right after we wean calves. Um, we've already got a very weak cull cow market. It dropped uh, much more dramatically than we really anticipated this summer. Uh, there may not be a lot of good opportunities between now and about Thanksgiving, uh, but if it stays as weak as it is, uh, and we get to that point before you make those culling decisions, producers may want to think about the possibility of retaining those cows through the winter, at least for a while, January, February, March, and putting some weight on them. Many years that pays off pretty well if you have some feed resources that you don't have a higher valued use for. So I think it's kind of a wait and see unless you need to do something right now. There's really not a lot of good opportunities in the in the near term here for this cull cow market. Just kind of keep an eye on it. You bet. Okay, Daryl, thanks a lot. Hi, welcome back to the weekly Mesonet weather report. A nice, albeit short-lived cold front moved through the state this week, giving us a one-day break from the late summer heat. The front is easily seen on the Cattle Comfort Index for the morning of August 29th, where temperatures behind the front are in the comfortable range but ahead of the front, we see red caution numbers at or near 100. Until the last week, August temperatures have been very moderate throughout the state. I have shown this map before, indicating that we went below normal with average temperatures in late July and stayed below average until late August before returning to near normal temperatures. A concern I have had is how this cooler period would affect our late summer crops such as cotton. Cotton degree days are the number of hours that occur between a temperature range of 60 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit over the growing season. As of August 28th, we have received 2,521 days. The previous five-year average on this date was 330 days less. In summary, the cotton crop should be well on its way to maturing properly. Now here's Gary with a better looking drought monitor and more on the moisture situation. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. 
and we're making great progress on the drought through August, with now most of the state completely out of the drought categories on the drought monitor map. But we still have a few holdouts. Let's get to the newest map and see where we stand. Well, it's pretty easy to see where we have the worst drought continuing across uh, southwest Oklahoma. Um, that extends up into west central Oklahoma and a little bit along the Red River to the east. However, we still also have a little bit of severe drought centered on Osage County over into southern Washington County up in far northeastern Oklahoma and a little bit of moderate drought surrounding that. Other than that, just the far western Oklahoma panhandle, uh, those areas, if we can get some good rains, we can really knock this drought out by the time we get through fall. How about that August rainfall? This Mesonet map for August 1st through the 28th shows really good rains, very spotty in nature, however, but still good rains across eastern Oklahoma, parts of central Oklahoma through northwest Oklahoma, out into the Panhandle, and also centered on Jackson County in far southwest Oklahoma. We still also have those areas with less than two inches in southwest Oklahoma along the Kansas border, uh, but all in all, a really good August. We can see that on the percent of normal rainfall map for August. Anywhere you see those greens and dark blues, that's really good rains for August. Um, you can also see those areas that have missed out on the rain, such as southwest Oklahoma, parts of along the Red River, and up into northeast Oklahoma, again centered on Osage County. Uh, and uh, the rest of the state, really good rains for much of the summer, drought quenching rains, and those are the rains we hope continue into the fall so we can uh, blast this drought right out of here. We do, however, need those rains to start falling in those select locations that have missed out. Southwest Oklahoma, Northeast Oklahoma, and the far western panhandle. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Here we are at the beginning of September and planters are going to be rolling sooner than not. And, and David, what are some of the things that producers should be thinking about if they're going to plant wheat this year? Yep. So I like to start that question off with how I would, how I would probably in any year, no matter how right. what the conditions are, are, are we're facing at the moment, is first really focus on those, those basic agronomic practices. So trying to use optimal planting dates we can. I know we're always battling Mother Nature, but trying to use those optimal planting dates, using good seeding rates for your type of management system. Have you calibrated your drill recently? Have you soil sampled? recently. Maybe that's a spot we can cut back on, on fertilizer costs. So those types of, of agronomic practices. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to, to the different types of inputs that we're going to be using, I like to start off with building that foundation off of, of good genetics, the type of variety that's going to fit your type of, of management system and how high can you do you want to push that bar. Those other types of maybe pesticides right. that we might use to try to control these different pests in season. It's important to have those boots on the ground and, and be scouting. We, we were very dry last year. We ended up not having a whole lot of disease for the most, most part in the state and knowing our variety that we've got, we didn't need to have to put out that fungicide in, in most cases. So just maybe penciling it in, trying to see if I can budget in a fungicide for example, but having those boots on the ground and be out there scouting and if the time comes, be willing to pull the trigger on it. In years past, we've, we've looked at the, at, at the dual purpose versus grain only. Last year, we had the potential for a great dual purpose crop, uh, but parts of the state didn't see the moisture that they were hoping for. Is, is there a dual purpose wheat variety that, that looks better than others this year? Well, it, it'll just comment kind of on last year, yeah, yeah. because in a way this, this, this August that, that we, we've had is really kind of setting up to be like last year. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, it's something that is different than last year, and I don't hope to jinx it, but the, the wheat prices are at least going north, right. going, right. In the, right. going in the right direction. So by, with, the way, with, the, with the drought that we had last year and the need for forage, there's still, I think, going to be a lot of focus on, on forage. Mm -hmm. And moving into this year, like we said, it, it is setting up to be like that, so trying to focus on forage and then to come back to, to the, the variety selection. The neat thing about wheat is actually the forage production on a lot of these varieties is actually pretty good. A lot of it for being dual purpose, where we start to really see the differences come in is, is those varieties that can handle that grazing and be able to respond to, or be able to, to, to come back from that grazing and still be able to put on grain yield. The varieties like, like the Duster or like the Gallagher and potentially like Smith's Gold has, those types of, of good overall dual purpose varieties. And if, that, if, if that's the type of management system you're wanting to work with, that's, that's a good start. And then there are others, others out there as well. 
looking back at 2017 and 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 with the with the potential of the same conditions in 2018, what were 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 there better planting dates than others across the state? And I understand Oklahoma is a large state and there's a lot of variability in there, but but were there were there differences in planting dates in 2017 crop to look forward to in 18? Well, in 17, how that ended up, absolutely. <laughs> if for those who planted early, trying to target fall forage and were able to protect it from fall armyworm at the time, right. they ended up having a little bit of pasture to be able to graze. For those who might have waited for the fall armyworm to cycle out, it got hot and it got really dry. Yeah. So we were trying to plant and establish wheat pasture, but we didn't have the moisture to get it established. So that ended up pushing our essentially our planting date later in, into the year. If we're going after forage, we need to plant, plant early. We like to have that kind of September 10th to 15th for most of the states being the ideal for dual purpose. Right. And if you're grain only, you shift that planting date back three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're if we've had this wetter August yeah. overall, and if we still we still have this good soil moisture by the by the end of the month, beginning part of September, and if we're going to plant earlier, that can that can be fine. But we just but like last year, we really be out there scouting and really be in to try to protect that that against that fall army worm. You're actually going to be taking a new position in another location. Yes, that, that's true. I, I will I'll be leaving OSU. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, anyone needing help? Absolutely, always, always. You've got the opportunity to contact your local county, county educator, mm -hmm. our area extension staff as well. Okay, well David, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And for Thank more you. information on wheat in Oklahoma, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Football season kicks off today and teams are rising and falling, and unfortunately so is the wheat prices. So Kim, tell us why uh, wheat prices have started to decline. Well, we, we saw that decline. I think a big part of that is Russia front-loaded their export sales to uh, try to beat the uh, Russian government uh, restricting exports, and they'll probably do that on down the line. Uh, you look at also the spring wheat production, it's about uh, 200 million bushels higher than last year. Remember, hard red winter wheat was 100 million bushels, so the spring wheat more than offset uh, the, hard, the decline in hard, hard red, plus you can substitute or blend that uh, high protein hard spring wheat with poor quality uh, hard red wheat and make up for some of that loss. So I think that's the major reasons it went down. We had a little b bump uh, in prices this at the end of the week. And I think that was the, the market just saying that, uh, hey, Russia can't continue to do this forever. So, but have wheat prices bottomed out, do you think? I hope they've bottomed out. Uh, we, won't, we won't know until we see what happens in the Black Sea uh, region and what uh, happens with uh, Argentina and Australia. You know, the northern hemisphere wheat crops pretty much harvested. We know what we got there. That's about 85% of the world's wheat production that we know. So we got Argentina coming on down the line and you look at Argentina, uh, they're uh, up 55 million bushels in production this, this year, but in Australia it's down 54, so pretty much uh, even out there. But Argentina and Australia and Russia will determine if, if prices have bought them. I think they have. So planning's about to start picking up. Uh, what is your projections for the 2019 harvest? Well, if you'll look at just about every supply and demand estimate, uh, the world uh, wheat supply and demand, uh, we're going to use uh, significantly more wheat than we produced this year. If you look at U.S. wheat, we're going to use more wheat than we produced this year. If you look at just hard red winter wheat, uh, we're going to use more than we produced this year. And remember going into harvest, what gave us our $5 plus wheat? The world was short of protein wheat. We produce protein and that's why we got uh, $5. We're gonna, if we used all of that, and that's what the supply and demand estimates tell us, then we're gonna come into the 19 harvest short of protein. And I think that's gonna give us a $5, $5.50 price. I, I think short of protein, we're gonna be in the same or worse condition than we were, were re we were in last year and the world's gonna need our wheat. So with all the wheat still left in the bin, what should producers do? Well, right now, if I can afford uh, uh, the risk of slightly lower prices, I think I'm going to hold it because if the, uh, the Russia puts the 
a damper or uh, puts a quota on how much they can export, our prices are going to increase because the world's going to have to come in to our market. Now, our export sales are 43 percent less than last year. I think they'll pick up as we get on out into that uh, November, December, January, February uh, time period and prices will be higher. I believe this year I'd gamble on that. However, if I was using that a third, a third strategy, I'd stick with it. All right. Thanks, Kim. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist at Oklahoma State University. Let's eat. According to labor statistics, the average American household spends over $7,000 of its budget on food. Data indicates that most Americans use 43% of the annual food expenditures on eating out. This includes fast food, vending machines, restaurants, and food trucks. Food trucks have become a large part of the food industry in just the past 10 years. In 2015, the annual revenue for food trucks was $1.2 billion. In 2017, the National Restaurant Association estimated that food trucks revenue to be $2.7 billion. An estimated 3 billion mobile restaurants are in operation by serious foodies in over 300 U.S. cities. Food trucks menus boast a fusion of flavors and unique cooking techniques that result in delicious experiences for the taste buds. Consumers can even track where their favorite trucks are located through social media check-ins. Oklahoma City has 117 registered food trucks, while Tulsa boasts 64. Even though these food trucks are homed out of specific cities, doesn't mean they won't travel. Without the limitations of a stationary building, food trucks are able to participate in fairs, weddings, family reunions, and other events. Some cities have even developed food truck parks. If you are looking to try a different dining experience, visit your local food truck. For more information about FAPC, visit us at our website at fapc.biz and download our app or sunup.okstate.edu. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at our website and also follow us on YouTube and social media. From the Payne County Fair in Stillwater, I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.